Dan, you briefly touched about the difficulties in evaluating artificial intelligence. So what do you think of the Turing test as a way of doing that? Well, I think the Turing test, the idea that um, a judge can't distinguish between the, uh, the verbal output of a computer versus a human, is an interesting but very limited test. Um, I can imagine a computer that can pass a Turing test with flying colors that has absolutely no sentience, has absolutely no knowledge of what it does. And, and, and there's been a lot of classic work done on this, the uh, Chinese room problem, those sorts of things. So while I think the Turing test is an interesting mark along the way, I don't really see it, I don't attribute to it the significance I think that maybe many other people do. I think um, the idea of developing natural language is one component that will contribute to the complexity that would be helpful to generate an emergent uh, generalized artificial intelligence and sentience perhaps. But uh, I could see that happening with no language really at all. I think uh, an understanding of the world, the ability to control it uh, in a variety of ways, um, and a sufficiently complex uh, presentation of that, um, implementation of that, um, may very well be sufficient without you know, what we would consider traditional language at all. So there are a lot of different ways to communicate. The other thing is that you know, we talk about human intelligence, but what is human intelligence? To me, there are so many different ways to be intelligent. So the classic way, of course, is sort of the, uh, you know, the SAT way. You answer a lot of questions and you're smart. But I think that's a very limited view of intelligence. Uh, I've met people who um, are so smart about understanding social situations, who can tell if someone's lying to them instantly, who get motivations of other people. Um, I, people are smart about being able to design something that's beautiful and enticing. People are smart about being able to create music. Um, people are smart about recognizing faces and understanding a family situations. Uh, you know, so we talk about intelligence, but we really gloss over intelligence. This idea that it's, it's all about reading books, I think, is a very, very narrow view. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, I think we need to incorporate these things. It's not just something that comes up with all the answers to the, to the questions on the multiple choice test. It really isn't. And in that way, when we talk about communication, uh, I think language is in the same sense, verbal language is a very limited way to talk about communication. I mean, think about body language, uh, gestural languages, expressive things, uh, artistic uh, communications. Uh, there are just so many different levels of that. So I see the Turing test as a fairly limited uh, measure of progress in the artificial intelligence world. Nevertheless, it's a nice benchmark, and, and it'll be interesting to see you know, the progression in, in satisfying it. And what do you think of Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics as a way of structuring our relationship with sentient machines and robots? Yeah, so I think that, that Asimov came up with some great uh, concepts in terms of how we are going to hope that our robots behave. Um, actually hardwiring those laws in I think is going to be a challenge. But um, it's a small framework on which to begin the larger question of uh, when you have a sentient creature, what rights are assigned to it? And when that sentient creature reaches a level of intelligence that's equal to or greater than human intelligence, what rights are assigned to that? So dogs and cats, I don't know if you call them rights, but they certainly have, we have ethical responsibilities to creatures such as that to not allow them to be in pain for no reason, for example. And uh, those kind of ethical guidelines are going to follow us into the world of artificial intelligence as we, as we find these mechanical creatures or computational structures um, exhibiting behavior that you and I would attribute um, intelligence and sentience to. So I think that Asimov got an interesting and, and very uh, good start from a discussion point of view, but uh, it goes way deeper than that. Ray Kurzweil is often criticized for being too optimistic. What, in your opinion, is our chance of surviving the singularity? Well, I think that there's a lot of different definitions of the singularity. And rather than try to just go into wild speculation, which 
kind of almost by definition it is. I would say I am very optimistic about the idea that exponentially increasing technology, such as information technology that we have today, is going to make, make the world a better place and is going to uh, alleviate a lot of human suffering and is going to allow us to um, expand our creativity. It's going, to, it's going to free humans from some of the mundane tasks that we've had to do. You know, uh, when, when we were able as human beings to begin farming, uh, having a community, allowed the, um, the beginnings of craftsmanship, allowed the beginnings of literature, because suddenly people's time was not 100% involved in simple survival. And we are still at a level where we spend quite a bit of our time um, generating the goods or the things or services or whatever we need simply to put food on the table and uh, heat in the house. And I think that um, technology has tremendous potential to free us from those bonds and to allow human creativity to, to be expressed by so many more people, um, to free us from the bonds of, of uh, mundane tasks. So I'm not sure about the whole singularity picture, but I have, I'm very optimistic about the potential for technology to make our lives better. Well, you mentioned the potential of technology for making our lives better and for alleviating suffering, but interestingly enough, much of the money coming towards artificial intelligence is coming from military agents. So, Dan, do you think that the process of arming artificial intelligence would change our chances of surviving a technological singularity in any way possible? Well, I think that the, uh, the concept of uh, putting guns in the hands of robots is of great concern. Uh, and as those robots uh, develop more and more artificial intelligence and uh, are attributed more and more autonomy, I think there is a risk to that. Um, and we need to, to seriously consider the potential for, for um, negative consequences. And in our current structure, we're really not effectively doing that. It's sort of uh, the idea of having a, a gun that can shoot from a place without risk to our side, so to speak, um, is very appealing. And there is concern that at some point our side might be all of humanity. <laughs> uh, that's a scary thought. So, but it's not just guns in the hands of robots, okay? I mean, really what we're talking about is how much responsibility are we willing to give to autonomous mechanical systems? Because in the end, if, if the Skynet takes over, they're not going to need to shoot us. They just can turn off the water and electricity and we're already in a lot of trouble. So, um, so I think it goes a lot deeper than just the fact that military drives a lot of the funding for this. I think we need to um, as these systems become more complex and, and um, develop more autonomy, we are going to need to find ways to control them. On the other hand, I, I think that the tools that we're developing in the artificial intelligence world have the potential to, to give us uh, substantial control. But it's a serious question, and it's one that, that deserves deep discussion. Dan, we're coming towards the end of our interview today. And I would like to ask you if there's a single thing, a single message that you would like for our viewers and listeners to take away from this interview with you today. I think I, I already mostly said uh, the, the big message, which is whatever you're passionate about, whatever it is that um, excites you, whatever it is your dream, you mustn't let anyone tell you that you cannot do this thing. And the flip side of that is every single day, Every day, you have to do something to advance that dream, to get closer to it. It's so easy to skip a day and then skip two days and then skip a week and a couple years go by and all of a sudden you're in trouble. So um, I sort of say a little bit in jest, but to some extent true. Worst thing that can happen to you is get a good job in your 20s, right? Because you don't want to get comfortable, okay? You don't want to get comfortable. The time goes by so fast every day. Work at that dream every day. Bring it closer. And you know what? Have fun while you're doing it.
Dan Barry, you're an inspiration for all of us here at Singularity University. Thank you very much for spending this time with us today. Ah, I appreciate the invitation, Nick. Look forward to talking to you again sometime.